Welcome to the Volpe Report podcast, the state's premier public affairs show dedicated to the topics that matter most to Pennsylvanians. I'm your host, Chuck Volpe. Join us now as we speak to this week's guest. The following half-hour show is a paid political program and is not endorsed by this station, management, or staff. The following program is sponsored by Excalibur Insurance Management Services. We welcome to today's show the Republican United States Congressman-elect from the 8th Congressional District, Rob Bresnahan, who defeated six-term incumbent Democratic Congressman Matt Cartwright. It was considered one of the biggest upsets in the country, also one of the most expensive, to the tune of $40 million. Rob was born in Kingston. As a young boy, he grew up in the family business, Kaharcha Construction, which were electrical contractors, and was a union shop affiliated with the IBEW, which stands for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Rob would sweep the floors. He learned how to wire junction boxes and other duties. He has a strong work, work ethic forged by getting up at 4 a.m. to plow, a snow for, plow the snow for his neighbors in the wintertime. Then off to school, followed by hockey practice, then off to help his mom at the family's bowling alley, all while attending the academically renowned Wyoming Seminary High School. Rob went on to earn his bachelor's degree from the University of Scranton. And while in school, at the age of 19, he became the chief financial officer of his grandfather's business, Kaharcha Construction. Rob is a fifth generation Northeastern Pennsylvanian, an accomplished businessman, college athlete, a former chairman and joint apprentice training committee member and trustee for the health, wellness, and annuity for the IBEW 163 local union shop. He is also a community philanthropist and is completely dedicated to facing challenges and solving problems. It was that background and with those motivating factors that caused Rob to become a candidate for United States Congress in January of 2024. On tap for today's show, we will discuss his race and what he credits for his victory. We will hear about the orientation process, which he described as trying to drink water from a fire hose. Finally, we will discuss committee appointments and his top priorities when he is sworn in on January 3rd. Rob lives with his fiance, Chelsea Strube, who is the weekend anchor and news reporter for WNEP Channel 16. This is the Volpe Report, a weekly news and political interview show examining the latest local, state, and national issues with Chuck Volpe. Insightful, informative, controversial, the area's premier political talk show, The Volpe Report. Congressman, welcome to The Volpe Report. Hey, thanks for having me back. Well, well, you, you know, that's, I, 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 I'm honored, obviously, uh, to call you Congressman now. I've been calling you a Rob for uh, the last, uh, you know, since Christmas, and the Christmas party we did the interview, and, and multiple times on my show. And, uh, you know, it one still of the feels things- very weird for me, Chuck. I'm, I'm still adapting to <laughs> this congressman elect title, which let me first by, start by saying I am so incredibly humbled that the people of northeastern Pennsylvania are willing to give me a chance to represent them. This really, truly was David and Goliath, your race against uh, what I will call not just a House Appropriations all-powerful chairman going for like a seventh term, beside that part. You're talking about a Democratic scion of one of the top Democratic politically connected families in the state. You didn't just take on anybody. You took on a powerful name partner of the Munley Law Firm. Now, they're friends of mine, as you know. Uh, Marion Munley is a friend of mine. My next door neighbor is Dan Munley, by the way, his brother-in-law, as we talked about. But having said all that, an amazing thing you did. So congratulations, Rob. Thank you. Now let's talk about uh, the first thing. By the way, I skip with the elect part. So much for formalities. Uh, to me, you're the congressman now. You're down in Washington uh, at orientation. So uh, I got to believe that when you go from the private sector, as you did, not the political sector, you had even more of a transition, if you will. It's not like you were a state senator or something like that and then and then went to Congress. So What's it like and uh, what's the experience? I think the viewers would actually be curious what happens for a congressman-elect when you get to that place. 
Well, I, I think it's going to be a two part answer here. And I think I need to to respond back to the preamble of, you know, beating a over decade long incumbent with the relationships in Lackawanna County. But, you know, looking back at the last 13 months and three days leading up to Election Day, we did not leave anything on the field. Our campaign knocked on over 50,000 doors. We drove over 50,000 miles. We raised the money and we had a message. And the message was exactly what I said on the show when you had me on last. It, you need an economy that works. You need borders that are secure and you need communities that are safe. And and look, at they threw the kitchen sink at me. I mean, I mean, at the end, the final two weeks, I mean, I, there was a Democrat funded super PAC who actually resorted to calling me a rhino uh, because they they realized that we were beating him on the messaging. And, you know, I am a political new, newcomer. I never ran for a public office before. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a heavy highway electrical contractor, but I'm five generations inside of Northeastern Pennsylvania. I didn't need advanced strategic consultants to tell me what is the best path forward for Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I was able to remain true and authentic to who I am and what I believe in. And I'm the first one to admit that I had an incredible life before going into public service. And at the end of the day, I decided to run because I love Northeastern Pennsylvania. I love the country and I love the people. And I felt that I could do a better job with more traditional conservative values, such as securing the border, such as making life affordable again, such as preventing gangs and fentanyl from killing our own people in our country and specifically inside of our district. But Going into orientation, it is like drinking through a fire hose. Um, <laughs> I mean, there is health ethics training where we have to learn about, you know, we have to do an office selection, a suite selection that takes place next Friday. Um, we had to meet with the House Administration Office to figure out health insurances and 401ks and dental and vision coverage, stuff that I always did traditionally in the public sector or in the private sector. But now going to the public sector, um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's very, very different. Um, you know, in my corporation, in my private life, it, you know, we would make decisions. I always described the, the private world as skiing down a mountain and trying not to hit a tree and, and continuing to, you know, to meander our way down and stay with inside of the envelopes. But here, it's just a totally different world. And, you know, a promise that I made was that the day that I assume office, we will hit the ground running because the people of Northeastern Pennsylvania and quite frankly, our country can't afford to have a gap in coverage. Um, right now, we are also in the process of navigating steering committees um, on what committees you're ultimately going to serve on. Uh, we've always had a long history of appropriators in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, obviously, my predecessor, Congressman Cartwright, was an appropriator. Uh, Don Sherwood was an appropriator. McDade, Dent, Flood were all appropriators. And down your way, Paul Kajorski. Paul Kajorski down your way. That right. was the probably, uh, and then I want you to continue, but just interject. That was probably the most significant upset in the nation. It was covered in the nation when uh, a mayor from K uh, uh, Hazelton, Lou Barletta, upset like a like a fourteen term, thirteen term House Appropriations Chair, and uh, that was like a giant oak falling. And so was your race. Uh, with Matt Carr, right? But I'm sorry, I had to interject that. No, I mean, with Northeastern Pennsylvania has always had a long history of appropriators and with transportation, housing, and early uh, urban development, that's a, a big passion of mine. It's it's unlikely that a freshman will make their way onto such a powerful committee right out of the gate. Um, however, listen, we just did slay Goliath here. Uh, we left it all in the okay. field. We were consistently one of the top fundraisers in the United States out of challenger races. And last quarter three, I outraised in our team. When I say I, I mean, listen, I'm just the name on the top of the ticket here. But our team, we outraised every single Republican member of Congress in the wow. state of Pennsylvania. Wow. And we raised more than all of the challenger, the Republican challengers combined okay. for a million two in quarter three. Now, this is to show what we actually ran against. Congressman Cartwright raised a million dollars more than us. Right. I mean, I'm not sure where all the dust settled here, but we have had to be outspent by no less than eight to ten million dollars. I mean, this race was over forty million dollars, one of the most 
expensive races in the country. And if you look at it, you realize why. I said on your show, there was not going to be a Republican majority in the House of Representatives without winning this seat. And right now, there would not be a Republican House of Representatives majority if we did not win our seat. Well, I'll go a step further. Uh, your colleague down there in the freshman class to our east uh, from that, like, Bethlehem East to Allentown area. Ryan McKenzie. Of course, Ryan McKenzie also upset a three- or four-term incumbent in Susan Wild. And uh, so, yeah. And went he, through a bitter three-way primary. Right. No, I do remember. Yes, I do remember that. So... So you want to talk about Northeastern Pennsylvania, in a way, is the center of the political universe for the United States Congress. Because without what happened up here, led by you, uh, but, but, but here's the thing. In this media market, you know, your race, uh, because of who you beat, was really the marquee. That was the top. The, the other one, with all respect, great, great effort. That was kind of on the undercard in terms of the, the media market here. But, but again, uh, to your credit, you, you know, you did everything from an organizational standpoint. It was a textbook campaign. Uh, you're a good candidate. You know, you know, football teams need 22 players to make it a great team, which is why it's such a great sport. Uh, but it has, it, at the end of the day, the quarterback has to be that person. And in any great campaign, the candidate has to be that person. To give you an example, I was talking to some of my Republican friends around the state. People that know, people that participate, you know, like the Commonwealth Leadership Fund from Commonwealth Foundation, you know, Charles Mitchell and people like Matt Briette, who I know you know, and those kinds of people. Sure. And, you know, I posed a question to a number of them, including leadership in the Republican House, because I'm friends with all of them. Uh, you know, with the red wave that washed over, you know, this, this place in Pennsylvania and the rest of the country, and you're only down one seat in the Republican State House. How do you not flip one seat? And you know what the answer came back for the most part was? They raised a ton of money. They didn't get good enough candidates. At the end of the day, they didn't get good enough candidates. It's not just about putting an R in front of your name and saying, well, I support the Trump agenda and the America First agenda and all that. Yeah, that gets you in the ball game. You were a great candidate. It takes a great candidate with the resume and the work ethic, the intelligence, the ability to communicate and connect to people. That's how winning gets done. And you did. So, again, congratulations. Well, I appreciate that. I, I just consider myself a, you know, a hardworking, regular, normal guy that, you know, the hardest part about running was deciding to run. And, you know, like you, Chuck, I've always tried to help the right candidates the run, that would run for the right reasons that would do the right job. And that's always how I've been. I mean, whether it was a state legislator, a state Senate race, or, you know, gubernatorial races, that's always what I tried to support and look for in a candidate. Somebody that would go down there not to become famous, not to get a Fox contract, not to, you know, you know, be a, a rabble rouser, somebody that would go to work to do the right thing every single day and would leave it all on the field. And, you know, then it was a, I was asked to consider, oh my gosh, it wasn't this January, it was the last January where somebody said, why don't you ever consider running? And I said, well, listen, I have, a, you know, I have a great life. My companies are doing really well. I'm not done yet with what I'm trying to do in downtown Pittston. I have a fiance that likes me and, and thinking about dragging her through, you know, a, a congressional and what the ramifications would be on her professional life and career. Um, but I remember, you know, the first day that I filed to run was October 2nd. And the October 3rd was the speaker McCarthy vote. And I remember sitting with Chelsea at the kitchen table and watching all of that unfold and watching the caucuses be hijacked and, you know, no leadership for weeks on weeks on weeks. And I said, this is exactly why it's time for a change in leadership. This is exactly why Washington, D.C. is broken and it is time for a change. And, you know, it's, it's thinking about, you know, the, the next generation, my generation, my kids' generation, my grandkids' generation. You know, and and what kind of country are they going to be living in? Are they going to live in a home uh, in a place where they can afford to have a job, buy a home, and not be saddled with credit card debt? Are they going to watch illegal migrants, you know, and the federal government spend 175 billion dollars a year when our own veterans are homeless and are starving to death in the street, or our senior citizens that are keeping their homes set to 62 degrees? Um, staggering out medication, driving around all the broken bridges to be able to go to the grocery store and be able to buy half 
of what they used to buy. And that's just not the America that I know, love and care about. And I'm sure it doesn't resemble something that is familiar to you as well. So, Great. and that's why I decided to do this. And I've been, you know, you saw some of the ads where I started on third base, uh, which isn't true. I started on first base and I'm the first one to recognize that, but I had to get myself the third base. And that was by taking a company that had 50 employees and growing it to 175 employees and buying a condemned unfit for human, for human occupancy building in the downtown Pittston. And perpetually being on the balls of my butt, making it work by reinvesting and revitalizing a downtown, which I believe in. And I love Northeast Pennsylvania. I could have went to school in Philadelphia and Drexel for construction management, but you know, we got crushed in 2008 and I chose to be here because this is where my family is. This is where my friends are. This is where my life is. And at the end of the day, being down here, I'm going to vote my conscience and I'm going to vote my district because that these are the people that were willing to give me a chance to represent them. And at the end of the day, that's where my loyalty will lie. What I'll, you know, I've done a bunch of postmortems, Rob, about what happened to the Democratic Party, the National and State Democratic Party. And the, the, you're touching on things that, that bear, bear mentioning now. And that is that two things were, 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 were outliers for me. One is they lost complete touch with the people in their district. When they got to Washington, it was like they were brainwashed into an agenda that they pushed. And what was scary about this whole thing, I, I gotta tell you, I found great irony, Rob, in the, in the notion that President Trump was a threat to democracy, Hitler, fascist, you know, our last election, garbage, complete total garbage, which told me, one, you have nothing else to talk about, <laughs> obviously with the voters. But, but they all, you know, spoke from the script. I interviewed two weeks or so, three weeks before the ele election, Tulsi Gabbard, who, of course, now is in Trump's cabinet, co-chair of his transition team. A lifelong Democrat, you checked every woke box. Woman of color, Samoan, uh, fast track, vice chairman, Rob, of the DNC, and then runs for president four short years ago as a Democrat. And now she's a Republican and in a great support. I said, she said, Chuck, she said, they will not allow you to be a free thinker. They will not allow you to speak on anything but what the messaging is. In fact, I just saw recently a Democratic congressman, it was on a national news story, Rob, that he came out and, and, he, and he saved a seat. He won re-election. And he said, he said, there's going to be a change now in this party because when I said that I thought it was wrong that biological males should be able to compete against, against, against my daughters, he said I have three of them, and other girls, and this, this nonsense about we don't know what a woman is, he said, I spoke out against it. I told the voters I don't support it. They, they tried to beat him. They tried to primary him. Then they put money actually into his opponent. It's an amazing thing. So to, what, to back to Tulsi. Tulsi said, Chuck, they tried to censor me. They wouldn't let me represent my people. And they did it to the point where I just said, the hell with you, I'm done with this party. And she made the switch first to independent, now eventually, of course, to Republican. So what you're she didn't talking leave about the party. is that- The party left her. Exact, exactly right. That's good, as it left me, because I'm no longer, of course, a Democrat. So that was the, was the one thing I wanted to uh, comment about. And, and here's the other thing, talking about your race. And by the way, today, as we talked off camera, the Supreme Court, in breaking news, Pennsylvania Supreme Court has thrown out those ballots that lack significant things, whether it was a date or a signature, which all but assures Dave McCormick is the United States senator now elect for Pennsylvania, uh, which I think will be a good thing for our state. But, but even with uh, Bob Casey, who again, personally, he's a friend of mine, they are examples of, for the power they got, in meaning Matt Cartwright, they almost put the area in a way to do the stuff they did for the area. They voted on issues that didn't represent the values of this area. And now you're going to change that culture. So Godspeed in that, in that effort. Listen, and you, you heard me say, I don't think Matt is uh, Congressman Cartwright was a bad guy. Actually last week I lost my grandfather. He had reached out and sent his condolences and we plan on. Add mine. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Oh, 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was, you know, he's been sick for a while, but he got to see us pull off the W and uh, I think he can sure. finally rest peacefully and sure. know that I'm off the, the company payroll now. And, you know, I'm, I'm down here trying to make a difference and fight for our country. But, you know, he, he had reached out and sent us condolences and we plan to sit down and, and talk about some of the, the projects that he was looking to bring back to the area. Um, and you know what, it's just time for a change. And, you know, if I start to vote in a way that doesn't represent Northeastern Pennsylvania, I hope you will have a challenger of mine on the show exposing where I've lost my way. And you know what, I want to sit down, I want to deliberate saying, hey, well, why do you think this is the best path forward? Or, or why this is why I think that is the way. And that's something that I really appreciate about Mike Johnson is he will deliberate to death. Um, about an issue, about what someone thinks is the best trajectory forward for whatever it's their district, uh, whether it's debt re debt reconciliation, but like, and, and you know, that's always, you know, just because I'm in power doesn't mean it's my way or the highway. It, let's talk about it. And ultimately, that's what I've been now duly elected to do. Um, but it's how are we going to bring the best and pra most practical use resources back to the district? How are we going to create jobs? How are we going to perpetuate advanced manufacturing? How are we going to secure our borders and prevent crime from taking place in our streets, being just 100 miles away from Philadelphia and New York City? Uh, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, and, you know, we need to roll up our sleeves, get to work. And constituency service is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, I don't have any intentions of taking my MRA for, for any housing or hotel allowances. I want every dollar that we can to go back into the district to provide the absolute best constituency services. We have a VA in our district. Our veterans need to be advocated for. And at the end of this, I'm just like I ran our race where I left nothing on the field. It's the same way that I plan to govern and legislate. By Donald Trump embracing clearly, optics matter in this business, as you know, Rob. When he put his arm around Mike Johnson, had him with him at Mar-a-Lago on election night, had him on the stage and walked his, put his arm around him, he, and pretty much, he didn't have to say anything. But to me, it was a clear signal letting everybody know Here's my guy. Let's get behind him as speaker. He's going to carry my agenda. So uh, uh, that appears for me. Obviously, you have a better look of it, and you're going through that process. I yeah, actually, hope I just came from a conference. Just, I just walked out of conference to come to to join up with you here, and uh, you know, actually, just this weekend, uh, Speaker Johnson was with Elon Musk, Tulsi with President Trump, Don Jr. All at the UFC fight, and he was telling us the story about how they did a round trip, left Mar Lago flew to the UFC fight, um, was eating McDonald's on the airplane, <laughs> got back to mar lago at 4.45. Um, Speaker Johnson had to do an interview and Trump was on the phone with him. I, I think he got like 64 minutes of sleep and it was still firing on all cylinders. Yeah. But we did do the organizational conferences last week and there was nobody challenging. There was spirited debate. Right. Uh, obviously, there's a the national debt continues to increase. We have a lot of debt hawks. We have a lot of national security hawks. So there's definitely spirited conversations, uh, but there wasn't any coups to say the least to say, hey, we're going to try to you know vacate the speaker on day one. Um, right. You know, there was again spirited conversations sure. about some rules and orders, uh, but at the end of the day, the Republican caucus seems to be incredibly unified right now. One of the things not in your caucus, uh, I, I will be talking to Dave about this as time goes forward, is that I hope Thune, Senator Thune, who is the new from South Dakota, the new uh, majority leader, and they're going to have at least a six uh, uh, plurality, maybe even eight. It could go. I don't know if they called that last race yet. But having said that, a strong majority in the Senate. I'm wondering, I know if it were me, Rob, I would be having Chuck Schumer on the record. And I would put it right in the record. I want now, either we're going to make a commitment by joint resolution between our parties that we are not going to end the filibuster and that you're agreeing that if the shoe's on the other foot in a, in a few years, you will not end the filibuster because that's a protection for American people to give some sanity to what's an insane chamber, uh, uh, insane chamber a lot of the times. And I want to see, because they tried, as you're well aware, for about the last four years, to end the filibuster so that they can push their radical agenda through. And if not for, to me, two patriots, Joe Manchin from West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema 
who, was, who left the party to become independent but was a Democrat, if they didn't say we're not agreeing to this because you know the upheaval and disorder, if every time a party comes into the majority with the two-vote plurality, they end the filibuster and they just pass all this legislation, then someone comes in four years later and, and, and rescinds it, it would be a disgrace. I hope they get him on the record saying, hey, Chuck, how about the filibuster now? You want to you want to have it now? Now we have the votes. I'd like to get him on the record. That's the hypocrisy of the left, by the way. And, and how it changes with when one party is in control or the next. But, you know, I'm really excited to see what Dave McCormick is going to do. We spent a lot of time together on the I campaign. Know you, get. you get to meet, you get to really learn a lot about each other when you're sitting in the back of a van in Yuma, Arizona, at the southern border, watching a group of 50 to 60 illegal migrants illegally enter the country. And that's where I got to really speak and know Dave. And I'm very excited about what he will bring to the table. Well, as we run a, a little short on time, uh, Rob, what is your to-do list to hit the ground running there? On January 3rd, you're going to get sworn in as our next United States congressman. What issues are like uh, kitchen table issues, uh, budget issues? Uh, the southern border, working on legislation for that. If, have they given you any indication, by the way, about what committees you may be on? Uh, we're, we're right now. It's all in the steering process, and, okay. and you know, to answer that question, it's D, all of the above. But something that I have direct control over is hiring an incredible constituency service staff. Uh, we're working on building out the DC office. We're building out the uh, the locations within side of the district. Uh, looking to partner with other state representatives, state senators to make it a one-stop shop for government. Obviously, if it's a social security issue, that's not a state issue, but we want to make it as easy as possible for our people and our constituents to get resolved to challenging problems. Um, but, you know, we hire between, the most you can have is up to 18 people. So we'll be looking to hire, you know, in the, in the next two weeks, actually, my next meeting that I'm going to is to interview a legislative director. Um, but the second committee that I would be interested in serving on, if I'm not fortunate enough to get on appropriations, is transportation infrastructure. In the 119th Congress, surface reauthorization, there's a lot of clean water, there's a lot of road, there's a lot of bridge construction. That all be in a position, with us being in the majority, to deliver real tangible dollars and projects back to northeastern Pennsylvania. So if I was going to rank where I'd like to find myself, it's certainly appropriations, T-HUD, and, and moving into transportation infrastructure. Well, your experience, as you said, and what you did in your company and your life's work effectively, your family's business, would make you uniquely qualified, I would think, to, to know how to get that done in an efficient way. You probably, being in the private sector, know about all the inefficiency, <laughs> all the Absolutely. government regulation. And there are plenty of those. <laughs> the government overregulation. You have an administration committed to getting rid of the deep state in the regulatory state of unelected bureaucrats that are trying to tell Americans how to live their lives on everything. What refrigerator right. you can buy, what stove you can buy, uh, you know, what kind of car you can have. I can't believe it. It's like that's what was at stake in this election, Rob. We need to unleash American energy as well. I mean, the biggest of derivative of inflation is energy pricing. So making it cost prohibitive on whether whatever kind of natural resources we have that we have underneath our feet, we can't vilify those processes. We can do it responsibly. Uh, and I'm a conservationist at heart, but we can't bankrupt the American people in the process. There's no doubt. Yeah, like the end of the means still matters, matters. That, that if they had their way with the radical green agenda, they would have killed millions of Americans. The people that are too poor to afford, you know, or feed their kids right, or to afford the energy bills. And seniors, they're living on fixed incomes that like are like going to sleep with coats on. They, they can't afford the energy costs. And every time- One in two homes in Pennsylvania are heated from natural gas. One in two, 50%, 52%. Right, right. And they're trying to shut it down. So, well, uh, again, we're out of time, Rob. Let me say that uh, 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 it was a pleasure to get to know you. You were a great candidate. Uh, you, you will be, I expect, a great United States congressman from our region. And, of course, you will have, uh, I hope you will, as others in the past have considered this, when you need to talk to your constituency, you have an open invitation to be on the Volpe Report. Dan is on, I want to say, at Muser, your colleague, uh, in his fourth term, probably two times per season, which means four times a year he's on this show. Love to have you back uh, on a regular basis to talk about what your experience, because your new eyes there, 
and you're going to be involved in committees that we haven't heard from. So uh, Godspeed on your uh, success for all of us. Thank you. Please, if you have openings, we'll consider that uh, a date and we'll make it happen. You got it, Rob. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Volpe Report podcast. Be sure to visit our YouTube and Facebook pages for upcoming episodes. You can catch up on the Volpe Report podcast on your favorite podcast provider.